The Michael E. Bush Center for the Arts at Maryland Hall welcomes you to Athletes for the Arts, a celebration of the critical role of the arts in the lives of our youth. We are streaming live from Maryland Hall in the state's historic capital. Hall of Fame coach of the New England Patriots, Bill Belichick, graduated from this building, once the original Annapolis Senior High School, one of the last graduating classes before Maryland Hall found its home here. Dedicated to art for all, Maryland Hall is the region's cultural core, convening and engaging all people in arts experiences that strengthen community. Former Speaker of the Maryland House of Delegates, Michael E. Bush's passionate spirit inspired tonight. An athlete himself, Mike was a running back at Temple University and pursued by the NFL until injury sidelined that dream. He returned to Maryland to coach athletics and teach and got involved in politics, tirelessly advocating for arts, athletics, and Maryland Hall. Tonight's event features Eric Catani, Aaron Mabin, musical performances by Nina Freelon. Tonight's presentation is brought to you by Katsif Brothers, the NFL Player Association's Professional Athletes Foundation, the Weston Annapolis, Comcast, Arts Education in Maryland Schools, Manis Canning and Associates, What's Up Media, and Thibodeau Media Group. Good evening, my name is Andre Collins and I'm the Executive Director of the Professional Athletes Foundation, the NFL Players Association's charitable arm. We're excited to welcome you to Athletes for the Arts and share in celebrating former players, Eric Catani and Aaron Maven. These two players exemplified the NFLPA's athlete and movement, promoting that players can live to play but it's not all that players live for. As the Union for NFL Players, we strive to showcase athletes' identities off the field. As leaders in the community, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, social activists, and artists. I began painting during my football career and continued afterward to create some balance in my life. I later created Smocks and Jocks, Smocks and Jocks in its 16th year is the Professional Athletes Foundation's signature Super Bowl event, showcasing artwork from former and active NFL players. Tonight, on behalf of all the sponsors, thank you for supporting Athletes for the Arts. Now I have the pleasure of introducing the host for this evening's event, Senior Vice President for the Washington football team, and first regular female on-air member of an NFL radio broadcast booth. Introducing my friend, Julie Donaldson. Thank you, Andre. You have made the Washington football team in the region proud through your efforts to help all of the players who came after you. I'm so excited to be here and thank you to everybody for joining us tonight. We have a full evening ahead for you, so why don't we kick things off with six time Grammy nominated artist Nina Freelon.
with gladness Hide every trace of sadness Although a tear may be ever so near That's the time you must keep on trying Smile, what's the use in crying? you find that life is still worthwhile If you just Perfect way to kick off this evening. That was tremendous. Nina and her fabulous band will join us again on the stage soon as Athletes for the Arts is both a fundraiser and advocacy event for Maryland Hall. To talk a little more about that, let me introduce Damien Sinclair, Maryland Hall's Director of Creative Advancement. Damien. Well, thank you, Julie. I appreciate it. Uh, and on behalf of the entire Maryland Hall board and staff, I want to everybody who is participating tonight, and thank you for watching this broadcast as well. Tonight is a fundraiser. We're raising critical funds for Maryland Hall and our outreach and education programs. We have an online auction that has been going on for the last two weeks. That auction will stay live until just before midnight tonight. I will be back a little bit later in the program to highlight some of the auction items, but if you are watching the show and have not registered for the auction, you can do that very easily. Just text Athletes for the Arts, all one word, to 243725. Again, that's Athletes for the Arts, all one word, to 243725. In addition to being a fundraiser, today is also meant to be an advocacy event. We are here to advocate for the critical role of arts education in the lives of our youth. We are going to do this event annually, early in January, as a part of the Maryland General Assembly every year. And so we will use this time to kind of raise awareness of the importance of arts education. In fact, we have partnered with Arts Education in Maryland Schools, and they have been helping us get the word out to legislators and to advocates across the state. In addition, one of the athletes who was participating this evening, Aaron Maven, was just selected as the keynote speaker for Maryland Arts Day on February 11th. Maryland Arts Day is a statewide advocacy event artists and educators from every county across the state of Maryland gather to connect with legislators in every legislative district to advocate for arts and arts education. We hope that you'll participate in that event as well. You can learn more at mdarts.org. We hope that soon uh, we can fill this entire house here at Maryland Hall uh, with you, with legislators, and with passionate art supporters. But until then, uh, we thank you for watching us tonight. Back to you, Julie. So the arts are a very deep part of my life. As my sister, she's a professional artist, and I do not use that word lightly, as she makes an absolute killing off of her work. To where now, I am really glad that I managed to snag a few of her pieces before she reached the point that I can't afford her. But it all started with a talent that she was blessed with and a passion for the many different mediums of art. And then the hard work to fine tune her craft, to make it hers, to make it speak to whomever ended up owning it. Now, I am glad she was afforded the opportunity to pursue her dream, that she stayed with it, to live it, and to let her work become more than just a canvas covered in oils. 
Meanwhile, if you want to know my levels, well, I can draw a mean stick man, but that's about it. But because of my sister's talent, I have a deep appreciation for the arts. So when I was recruited for this event by another very special person, my answer was yes, I'm going to do it. I will support. Malcolm Blacken is the Washington football team senior director of player development. He is a proud artist and uses his art to help reach the players on our team. The guys love him, we love him, and I know after looking at his work, you will too. Hi, I'm Malcolm Blacken, director of player engagement and player development for the Washington football team. I support Merlin Hall and the athletes for the arts. I used to love to pick up a pencil and, and draw on whatever I could. Um, I, I didn't grow up very wealthy, um, but it was a pastime for me um, where I could, um, my mom would buy me a coloring book and you would have thought she gave me a new 10 speed bike. I would rather have that than anything. And, and then I started dabbling in paint and watercolors first. And then I got into acrylics and I moved into oils. Um, so I've got experience in all of them because I've never stopped it. Um, I'm, I'm an older person now. I'm not going to tell you my age list, but I'm an older person now who, who, who understands the importance of finding a way to express yourself. Um, I use my art with the players because I'm always telling the players it's okay to do something else rather than run, catch, and tackle. It's okay to do something off the field that you love to do. We know you love football. I get that, but there's got to be something else in there too. You're not going to play when you're my age. So there's got to be something else that you got to find to do. And that's why I use my art as a vehicle. Every player in this building knows that I do art. And the head coach loves it that I share that with them because it's okay to do something else other than play football and be a professional football player. It's okay for me to be a professional football coach, but to also do things off the field, um, to uplift my community, to express myself with a different vehicle other than the sport I coach and for the player of the sport they play. You're more than an athlete. And I wanna make sure that you can use this as a catapult into something that you really love to do. And we're going to use football to move art along as far as we possibly can. His artwork is amazing. Of course, you can bid on it tonight. We hope you do. Now, the United States Naval Academy is a fixture in Annapolis and Maryland. Beat Army is a common refrain among followers. Our first athlete we will highlight this evening is Eric Catani. Eric never lost to Army during his four years on the yard. His naval service and NFL career only tells one side of this passionate artist and entrepreneur's life. I'm Eric Catani, and I'm more than an athlete. More than an athlete is not just a guy that runs a 454 or bench presses 400 pounds, uh, which I do, but uh, you know, I'm also an artist. I love the paint. Uh, I'm a businessman and I'm a philanthropist. I, I, that's, that's who I am as a person. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, went to Lake Catholic High School, played football, transitioned to Naval Academy, served my country, played in the NFL, and now I am more than an athlete. When I grew up, my parents were actually foreigners. So my mom was born and raised in Ireland. She's from Dublin, Ireland. She's uh, 15 of 16. So a large Catholic family. And my father's from Algeria. They came to the States in 1984. Um, and then, you know, they had me in 87. And I was in sports, but at the time I actually had a, a hearing problem. So I always, um, you know, struggled in school a little bit, but I always loved art. Or I was always doodling around and, um, you know, playing and doing that stuff. And then sports came actually, you know, I was really good at it. And then, you know, football kind of came my, my game I like to play. Playing NFL, it is a dream of everybody, but ultimately speaking, you know, I'm, I'm a realist. Playing NFL is, it's 0.02% of the population that has the opportunity to play in the NFL. So for me, I understood the NFL, you know, meant not for long. So I had other interests and hobbies, and that's where art came into my passion. Uh, while I was playing in the NFL, I got released from the Patriots, and uh, I decided, you know, let's start painting. And then I took a nuance of that and just, and just went full, full uh, speed ahead. Uh, I was actually in a military school. Uh, and I met this guy named J.D. Kamey, and he came up to me, he goes, hey man, uh, I heard you're an artist. I'm like, yeah, I, I like to paint, have a good time, and he goes, I have an idea. And then that's what literally jump-started Painter. We figured out the name there. Painter is direct-to-consumer business, so you upload any image to our site. If it's a uh, baby, wedding, dog, anything you want, you upload it to our site, you choose two mediums, oil or watercolor, your size, if you want frame, stretch or rolled, and then we match you with an artist around the world and it makes it hand painted in around three to four weeks, museum quality. It's amazing. It's just when they open the painting, it's the art of life's memories. It, it, it imbues what they thought and the, the emotion they felt. That's what art does. Art is such a, a passion that people don't realize when you do it, 
it decompresses you, it pulls that stress away. That, 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 that stress we have connecting our phones all day, the phones to the side, we have our paintbrush in our hand and then just you in the canvas. And they call it, you know, like, you know, being in your flow state. I think art is a language to portray something that uh, is inside you that you can't really voice. You know, for the, the kids, for the athletes, for the arts that are, you know, can be part of this, you know, they probably those, you know, a couple hours away from, you know, the, the environment that they're brought up in. They have two hours, three hours to get on this canvas or if it's singing, music, dance, just to step away and just be themselves and who they are. He was really strong in the weight room until he met me. Because I used to be a strength coach back then. <laughs> and you could tell him I said that. He's like, who's this 40-year-old guy that could outlift me in the weight room? All right, well, me. So you can tell him that. Uh, I'm excited, honored, and humbled to be speaking here for the Athletes for the Arts. I first want to say thank you to Malin Hall for putting this amazing event on. Damien St. Clair, the creative director, for having the... Um, you know, forthright to do this. This is a, such an amazing event, and I wish everybody could be here, experience this live in person, but due to the pandemic, as we know, you know, this, this will be virtual. We have some amazing artists here, and I, I've, I was backstage speaking to Aaron Maven and uh, Malcolm Blacken, and they are amazing artists, and some of the stuff they have here for the auctions is just incredible. So I want to talk about the ties, what I have with Maryland. You know, when I was 18 years old, I made one of the biggest decisions in my life, and that was to attend the United States Naval Academy. That brought me to Annapolis. I went to the United States Naval Academy to be a naval officer. I didn't go there, you know, to have the aspirations of playing the NFL. I went there to one, you know, learn leadership, and two, you know, to be a naval officer and you know get deployed. So after you know playing four years in the Naval Academy, I was fortunate enough to get signed by the New England Patriots. But due to my commitments, I had to serve overseas, so I deployed for a while. Uh, you know, got out of shape and then got back in shape. And then fortunately, um, after two years, went to the Patriots, but some heart happened. I got a letter in my locker stating that I had to go back to active duty. The assistant secretary of the Navy goes, hey, you know, it's time for you to go back to active duty. I'm like, I, I train, I did some different stuff. So I walk into Bill Belichick's office, which is crazy right now is this building I'm standing in, Bill Belichick went to high school here. Now he's, he's uh, Damon Sinclair has a picture of him in 1970. Uh, of the yearbook. So with him and that connection, you know, we talked to him, hey, you know, I have to go back. Went back to active duty. Um, during that time, it was kind of a tumultuous time. It was difficult. I did my, you know, my, my time deployment, but the Navy said, hey, we need more of you. So that's when art came part of my life. I had this uh, friend that was an amazing professional artist. His name's Adam Brett. He's like, Eric, hey, I want you to come paint with me. I'm like, hey, I got to focus on football, getting in shape, you know, getting back to my, the pinnacle of what I want to do. So he sat me down and says, hey, you know, let's relax, let's make a painting. The first painting I made was this huge four foot by four foot um, painting of a landscape, kind of an abstract style of the beach, which I was painting on. Posted on my social media, it, you know, it came great. I got, I got sold immediately, first day, I'm like, wow, this is actually something I love to do. It takes me from, you know, the stress and rigors of the military and the NFL, and it kind of slows me down. It takes my phone away, it kind of brings in that flow state that I talked about earlier in the video, of hey, like, let's bring that away and let's have that nuance of, hey, six hours, you step away from your piece, you're like, wow, I created that. So after I sold the painting, I um, realized that there's a business behind it, which that's when I started uh, Paint True a couple years later. It's a direct consumer art business. And that has, um, you know, with 2,000 artists that we support worldwide. We have artists in Europe, Africa, Asia, that they don't have the platform to sell their paintings and sell their stuff, so we give them that, that uh, amazing platform to do. So one of the things that Damien brought to my attention is this amazing young gentleman named Jalen. Jalen is an artist, but he's not an artist like me with paintbrushes. Jalen is a music producer, and he wants to be a music lawyer and a music executive. And he talks about these amazing things in the video you see afterwards is room for one more. He wants to bring his friends that don't have the uh, resources that hopefully this Athletes of Arts will bring to these communities around. And these resources will help him bring you know, room for one more each person. So I want to say thank you, God bless America, and also a uh, uh, shout out to Jalen for his, his next thing. So I appreciate it. Thank you. So I create music in my room. Uh, basically, I find a beat um, on BeatStars or YouTube, and I put that into my uh, DAW, which is a digital audio workstation. And then I create lyrics, songwrite, 
and create a song out of that. Welcome to coronavirus, we do this corona style. Stay inside, we play the game, won't see your buddies for a while. Being an artist is just like a journal for yourself. It's a way to just express yourself outside of words at times. It's a way to um, put yourself inside of something different. I tend to go to the University of Miami for the Frost School of Music. That's if I get in, but they have a music business program that I would really love to be a part of. Um, only because I want to be a music lawyer when I grow up and also own a record label to help other artists. So Hood to Good is the program where we take students from like Annapolis High School or around here that don't have the right resources to put together their art. You know, there's going to be children that live somewhere that um, doesn't enable them to shine like a lot of other kids do. And we'll just raise money through our performances and the things that you already created to actually purchase uh, equipment for ourselves and places uh, to display our art. I have to constantly count my blessings. I have two parents in a household, a nice household. It's not in a rough neighborhood location. It's not in a too prestigious location where I'll live in a bubble and forget about everything. So I absolutely enjoy where I was placed in life. The reason I wanna like become famous so fast and get rich is so that while I have these few friends that I have and like these people that I know, like I have still good connections with them and I know what they wanna do. What if I had the money to help you do what you want to do. And with that money, maybe you can help me by being a part of this team. So I just feel like I want to really help people that are around me come up too. Shout out to Adam, he's strumming guitars. These are my friends that we gonna go far. Hop in the ship and we go on to Mars. I have to teach myself, and this is something I struggle with, I have to teach myself not to put out stuff that I think other people will like. Because Whenever I get into that mood, that's when I start stepping out of like my zone and trying to make things for other people. But at the end of the day, a uh, true artist is gonna make something that they like and then other people will uh, like appreciate it because it relates to them. My name now is Room For One More. And it's, always, it's just like, we got room for one more problem, room for one more mistake, room for one more anything. Like, no matter what, we can always keep going because there's room for one more. If you always have room for one more, you can keep going forever. I gotta run, I gotta run, I gotta run, I gotta run. Such inspiration, of course, encouragement there as well. Look, Jalen is just one of four students that we're highlighting this evening. Uh, Damien, can you explain to the viewers who these students are and how they are a part of Maryland Hall? More than happy to. All four students, Jalen, Kennedy, Samantha, and Luis, who you'll hear from throughout the evening, all of them came through our outreach programs here at Maryland Hall. We offer ongoing initiatives to make art accessible to all members of our community, particularly those underserved locally. We introduce students to new arts experiences and provide meaningful, hands-on opportunities to increase self-expression and creativity. I want to highlight some of the people here at Maryland Hall who make this possible. Leslie Mills, our education director, oversees all of this. Laura Brino, uh, who is our outreach coordinator, and you'll hear her name in a lot of the videos as Miss Brino. Uh, not only is she our outreach coordinator, but she is also the founder of Hovenus Artistas. And Ken Starks, who is the director of the Hood to Good program. All of our programs are born out of community. Hovenus Artistas was born out of a lack of visual arts programming for Hispanic students in our community. Hood to Good, which is a heavily performance-based program, we host a lot of their showcases here at Maryland Hall, that was formed in response to the shooting death of a friend in 2018. I'm asking you tonight, if you moved by any of this, please consider making a generous contribution to Maryland Hall. That contribution will support our outreach 
education programs, as well as our Maryland Hall operations. You can make that gift through our auction platform, or you can go to marylandhall.org slash support. Again, that is marylandhall.org slash support. Thank you, and for considering a generous contribution this evening. You see how important tonight is. Now, in addition to performing all over the world and in front of countless audiences, Nina Freelon served four years as the national spokesperson for Partners in Education. Joining us once again on stage, Nina and her band. Better than sailing at midnight Better than diving for pearls Better than skiing at Aspen Better than feeding the squirrels Better than finding a horseshoe Better than losing your head Better than anything borrowed Better than any Singing right out loud or being spotted in a crowd Better than anything except being in love mm, Better than four sets of dizzy Better than cow bases band Better than Rollins and Cold Train Checking in at Monterey Better than anything Except being in love Being in love Better than Lucy and Desi Better than Route 66 Better than Huntley and Brinkley Better than quiz shows all fixed Better than guesting on Oprah Horn. 
Yes, there's nothing that better than being here with you. So let's talk about the arts for just a moment. Why do they matter? When I was a little girl, my mama told me that I actually sang before I spoke. Before I really was putting sentences together, I was making up songs. I remember singing freely to my dolls, things like Twinkle, Twinkle, little, little star. How I wonder what you are. Up above the world so high, like a diamond, like a diamond, like a diamond in the sky. So it was many years later that I found out that there is a right way to sing something and a not so right way, but it was a little too late by then. I had already learned the joy and the freedom of doing something that the musicians call improvisation. My parents created a safe space for me to explore my creativity. And Maryland Hall is a safe place for students to explore their creativity. A safe space to hold a mirror, a mirror that can show you who you are in the deepest, most vulnerable part of yourself. A place that allows you to be wholly and freely yourself. These places are important and the arts matter because they give us permission to be who we uniquely are as human beings. Now in a moment we're going to hear from a student here whose name is Luis. Check out how the arts have impacted and changed this young man's life. So I'm Luis Bello, um, I'm 21. I'm from originally from Mexico, Acapulco. I was brought over here by my mom when I was eight years old. I had always been doing art, but it wasn't until I came over here and saw kind of like different types, the different types of art that people were making that I got really sort of like inspired to really jump in there and start going out. In a way, it saved my life, I would always say that, because for a while while I was, I was in foster care at one point in my life because I was being pretty bad with my mom. And so I was taken away. And I got really depressed about that time. I uh, attempted to commit suicide about three times within that my stay in foster care. And uh, I realized that like art was the one thing keeping me from like going back and talking to those friends that got me in the trouble that I was in in the first place. Not saying that it was fully on them, obviously. Part of it was on me. But it was because of the people that I was hanging out with that I got sent away in the first place. So I tried to make it, make it a point that I wasn't going to go back to that crowd or doing the things that I used to be doing that got me in trouble. So like art was something that definitely kept me on the right track. I like walls a lot for some reason. I like, like, you know, where the plumbing and stuff comes out and like there's all those lines and stuff and everything is just like all over the place. Like I like. I don't know, I take pictures of it actually and I keep it with me, I don't know, for some reason that like the way that you don't even know the purpose of it, but you know, it has a purpose, motivates me in a way, or inspires me. Yeah, so that's like a couple different layers. It has spray paint, it has paint. I think a part of it was markers, because it is like a bunch of layering pretty much. That's sort of what makes my style. Well, I want to do my art and I want to, you know, go crazy. I want to do as much as I can. It's, it's what I like to do. But right now I'm trying to, first of all, get my, my own personal life organized before I go into this, but I want to create sort of like an art collective kind of thing um, for like a LGBTQ plus kind of community, you know, black folks, indigenous folks, like just make, I would just want 
to find those people and give them a platform. To me, Hoven as artistas was really important. I will say that is because they, like Miss Brino, since she's the founder of it, she like really cares about the kids. Like, you know, like it's not just art, it's like, you know, people talk about the stuff that's going on in their personal life. And then like they have been there kind of like for my full ride and like have continuously given me like a safe place, which is ultimately what it is. Just to be loved and be loved in return. 
All right, hello everyone. Uh, it's good to have you back as promised. I'm gonna be highlighting auction items for you tonight. Uh, we thought it'd be good to kind of walk you through some of it, especially some of the stuff that we're most excited about, so that as you bid and make donations, you can help support Maryland Hall. So we had a couple of different things going on. One of the things we did was we worked with some local artists to uh, create artwork on sports pieces, sports equipment. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of those. Uh, the first one here is a baseball helmet. Uh, this one was uh, created and crafted uh, by Jeff Huntington, who is a local Annapolis-based artist. It's a stunning piece in person. I hope you guys can see it. Um, in addition, I have a field hockey stick. Uh, Christine Zamuda created this piece. It's called Someday You Will Know My Name. Uh, it's a beautiful piece focusing on powerful women in history. Um, and I see the amazing RBG on the back over here, uh, but a great piece that's up online in our auction. A uh, local favorite and amazing artist, Kim Havel, uh, did uh, artwork on an oar. Uh, this beautiful piece uh, from top to bottom on one side uh, contains some of Kim's very signature oyster painting pieces. So a beautiful piece uh, that it can be yours tonight. Uh, and the last piece I have by an artist is a football helmet. Uh, this is done by the artist Jen Sterling. It's a very bright and colorful piece. Uh, looks even more amazing in person, and I recommend that everybody bid on this to kind of snap it up because it's a great piece. In addition to um, the artwork created on the sports pieces, uh, we also wanted to get some sports memorabilia into this auction. So there's a series of stuff online. Uh, there's a Navy football that's signed by Coach Ken along with a lot of great Navy gear, uh, but we also got uh, competing footballs from our two local teams. So from the Washington football team, uh, we have a football here. I'm gonna zoom in here on it. Uh, signed by Ryan Kerrigan. And so an amazing little piece here that's available. Um, and to compete with that, and I'll be very curious which one goes for more and see uh, how big our local fan base is, uh, we have a football from the Baltimore Ravens. This one is signed by Justin Tucker. And so for those of you that don't know, uh, Justin Tucker is actually an accomplished opera singer. It is one of my dreams to kind of bring him here as a part of Athletes for the Arts in the future, uh, but he was very generous to donate a signed uh, football from the Ravens. On top of that, we've got lots of other stuff that's a part of our auction online, including beautiful jewelry. Uh, this bracelet here from Zachary's Jewelry uh, is fully adjustable. Uh, and is a stunning piece in person. Uh, and so there are a couple of pieces online that you can find and you can bid on. Uh, in addition, we found, you know, one of the things that we're highlighting are these athletes that are tremendous artists. And so we received some very generous donations from the athletes that are participating in this show and others. This photograph here, and I think you can get a good sense of size with it next to me, this beautiful photograph was actually uh, taken by a legendary Ravens linebacker, Ray Lewis. So it's a, an amazing piece. It comes with a certificate of authenticity and it is available online for the auction. Uh, before I get to Malcolm's pieces, which are amazing, I do wanna share one very, very special thing, this guitar. So this guitar was donated to us by Paul Reed Smith, PRS Guitars, and it is uh, absolutely one of a kind, and it's one of a kind because there's a signature on it. That signature is the signature of Baltimore Orioles great B.J. Surhoff. So uh, one of a kind guitar, when I last looked, there were only two bids on it, and this is a signature one of a kind piece that you have to snatch up tonight if you can. All right. Um, over here uh, is a tremendous piece by Malcolm Blacken, who you heard from earlier today. Uh, this is called Super Bowl MVP. Uh, it is Super Bowl MVP because of the number 17. That is Doug Williams. Uh, Doug was the Super Bowl MVP. He was also the first black quarterback to start a Super Bowl and win a Super Bowl. It is a tremendous mixed media piece. There's a lot of depth and texture to it. Um, it, it just, 
I, I can't even do it justice with my own words, uh, but what makes this piece so unique and so special, and for those of you eagle-eyed viewers that were watching Malcolm's video, it was hanging behind him in his office, but we have it here now. Uh, what makes this piece so very special, it's got two signatures on it. Not only does it have Malcolm's signature down here, uh, but it is also signed by Doug Williams himself, the Super Bowl MVP. So an amazing piece that I hope uh, some special fan or some special art collector gets tonight. Uh, finally, I'm gonna highlight here uh, Malcolm's other piece, which is I'm for Justice, this beautiful flag piece, uh, which uh, is just a stunning representation of his work, a lot of texture, a lot of depth, a lot of creativity. That man is an amazing artist and we are so generous he donated these two pieces for the auction. I'm going to highlight finally the last piece that I'm going to kind of highlight tonight is uh, Mother and Child. This was a donation from Aaron Maben, who you're going to hear from in just a little bit. Uh, it's available online. Aaron not only is participating in Athletes for the Arts, but he's also a part of our Art of Activism exhibition that is currently up at Maryland Hall. This is a building-wide exhibition. It starts outside in the front of our iconic facade, this beautiful old 1932 high school. Earlier this summer, we hung six Black Lives Matter banners. We got six artists from across the state of Maryland to create artwork on those banners, and they are astonishing. If you are feeling uncomfortable because of COVID, the very least you can do is drive up to Maryland Hall, park in front, and check out these banners but the art doesn't stop there. You can come inside the building. In addition to those six artists, we have two more, and those artists together create the full Art of Activism exhibit that's on all three floors of this building. Their work represents their take on art activism. Those artists, and I'm gonna read their names uh, because they are very special people, Ashley Milburn, David Cassidy, Nikki Brooks, Quirky, Schroeder Cherry, Thomas L. Brown, Greta Chapin McGill, and of course, Aaron Mabin. All four of the students that you're hearing from tonight have representative work as a part of the exhibit as well. So why don't we uh, hear from one of those students, Kennedy. Uh, Kennedy is a powerful young artist who created a beautiful, a uh, hair series that is here uh, and that is a part of this exhibit. Uh, let's listen to how Kennedy's life was impacted by the arts. Art is an is a outlet. And I think that kids need that, especially because in their homes, you never know what's going on. It could be rainbows or it could be a, a storm in their home and they don't know. So that time when they're not at school and they're not at home, they can use art to express themselves, how they're feeling. You can tell by just the colors that they pick up how they feel. So that's why I, I truly believe that it's, it's helpful for them because they, they're able to release that. And it's helpful for us because we're able to learn from their artwork. Um, I believe art teaches you. I believe art, um, it also touches you and heals you as well. So I just, I know, I love it. <laughs> Not a lot of my blackness shows through my art, but that's something I want to start, which is why I started this collection, actually. So this is piece number one. I, there are two more. I wanted to do a collection of all black faces in black hairstyles, because that's what I believe our culture is known for. We change our hair like every five minutes. So I'm going to do a series of um, black faces with black hairstyles, maybe like some earrings in the next one, like just things that are in the black culture that we identify with and we love doing. Um, so this is something I'm also proud of because I love my blackness. I really just want to have my work speak to other people. So if someone else can see it and buy it and identify with it, that's the goal. Um, I want them to look at it and feel like, oh, if I look at this every day, I'll feel beautiful too. Hopefully my end all career would have been transforming my art into architecture and possibly I don't know, designing some massive building that came from a painting of mine. I don't know, something that's like very, like, what? Like, mind-blowing. Um, that's my goal.
I'm very excited to say I actually get one of those pieces to take back with me. So I am very proud and excited to have part of Kennedy's pieces. Thank you very much for that. Now, there are three brand new pieces in Kennedy's Hair Series in the show. So we encourage everyone to come out, experience all of the work before the show closes. If you could see this up close and in person, you would take some of this home with you. As we mentioned earlier, Athletes for the Arts is also an advocacy event tonight. It is my pleasure to introduce Aaron Mabin. Aaron has dedicated his post-NFL life to his art, his activism, and to his city of Baltimore. Our final athlete this evening is the epitome of what Athletes for the Arts represents from an advocacy perspective. I'm Aaron Mabin, a son of the city of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, went to Penn State University, played football there, played five years professional uh, football for the Buffalo Bills, the New York Jets, the Cincinnati Bengals, spent some time in Canada playing for the uh, Toronto Argonauts, and now I am an educator, author, community organizer, and a uh, general servant of the city of Baltimore. My goal wasn't just to get to the NFL, it was to be an example like those that I idolized when I was younger. You know, the Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's of the world, the Muhammad Ali's of the world, people that were transcendent not just in their sport, but in culture, because they use their platform and their opportunity to be a voice for the voiceless. And when you added on to that, the fact that the schools had budget cuts the year before um, I was drafted that were resulted in a lot of um, public schools in Baltimore City having to cut their art and music programs completely, I saw the need and I understood that if a kid like me didn't have access to the arts at a young age, I don't know where I would be the same way as I don't know where I would be if I didn't have athletics as a, as a venting um, opportunity for me at that age. I was an artist before I could form words and speak. You know, um, I was diagnosed with a lot of learning disabilities growing up um, and I was functionally illiterate until I was almost in the sixth grade. You know, so art was always my preferred language method of choice and after losing my mother, at a young age, you know, it became therapy for me. It became a form and a mode of expression for me. Me being as passionate about the arts as I was and being an artist myself, I felt that it was necessary for me to get in the game from an advocacy standpoint, lobbying for those programs to be reinstated and for the funding to be given. But I got a real problem with people that spend all of their time talking about what a problem is, but aren't spending any time working on fixing the issue. So one of the first things that we did was we started going into the schools that had cut their funding to these programs and supplementing those programs with our own workshops and programming. As a young kid, I had some lofty, gaudy expectations of what we were going to be able to accomplish, you know, thinking that the first check that I got was going to allow me to fix all of the problems that I had seen growing up. And really quickly, we realized that that wasn't possible. You know, we realized that there were way more schools than I had the capacity or the, 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 the finances or um, the bandwidth to be able to serve. But my whole thing is who can we ever expect to change that and make it better other than the people that are products of that environment? Us, the ones that grew up in it, we know how hard it is to make it out. You know, if we're really serious about changing that, what outsider are we expecting to come into cities like Baltimore and wave their magic wand and start making legislation and money and jobs and opportunity fall from the sky? It's not going to happen. You know, so my whole thing is my mentality has never been grow up, get a job, leave the hood, you know, send a check every now and again. No, it's go out, get a job, get resources, get opportunity, get a platform and bring those things back to my community. Art is the pulse of humanity in my mind. I know that that's a brash statement, but I really feel like, you know, take art out of society and what's left. At the end of the day, I think whatever future we're going to have, art is going to be a big part of how it's created, how it's reimagined. What is a reimagining if not a work of art? So in my mind, society is a work of art going forward. What type of painting that ends up becoming is up to us. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor to be here today, and it's an honor for more reasons than one. 
for once I for one I want to thank uh the entire staff here at the Maryland Hall uh especially my boy Damien and Emily that have taken such good care of me and the other artists during our time here uh I want to thank all of the uh, all of the participants in this exhibition I want to thank my fellow athletes and artists that are exhibiting with me and I want to thank all of the people that are watching and donating and participating tonight I'm proud of my involvement in this beautiful event for several reasons. When I was approached with this opportunity, um, it was a twofold approach. I was approached about this event, and then I was also uh, approached about the Art of Activism um, exhibit that I'm participating in as well. I felt like it was a perfect marriage of things that I wanted to accomplish and the things that the Maryland Hall was trying to accomplish. When you look at my career athletically and my career as an educator and an artist, I've pretty much built my entire brand around the whole idea of using art as a form of activism. So on the exhibit side, it definitely uh, it fit and it made a lot of sense. But on a more personal level, all of the work that I've done in my community has been rooted in my belief that the arts are the th symbiotic thread that, uh, that tie together all school subjects. It's something that every kid needs to be exposed to, and it's something that I built my entire foundation around in 2009 in reaction to the budget cuts that we experienced in the city of Baltimore. Understanding my experience growing up as a kid who was functionally illiterate until the sixth grade, who was really creating art before I could form words and speak, I understood how transformative the, the arts were in my life in the aftermath of my mother's death. Art had been, has been a form of therapy for me, it's been a form of, of stress relief. It's been a form of uh, enjoyment, excitement, and it's been something that allowed me to be audacious enough to be myself at a very young age. How many of those traits are something that our kids can afford not to have be a part of their lives? That's a serious question that I want everybody that's watching this broadcast to really take in. If our kids are not exposed to the arts, from where are they supposed to take their creativity? From where are they supposed to get their self-expression and their ability to communicate? From where are they supposed to get the feeling and the soul that we've grown accustomed to seeing performed in society for us on a day-to-day -day basis? Our kids need exposure to the arts. They need arts advocacy organizations like the Maryland Hall. They need safe spaces for them to come where they can use the arts as a tool to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, to be expressed. This is something that I'm always going to be passionate about and seeing the passion that these people here at the Maryland Hall have, the team that they have here has in working with their youth was definitely more than enough for me to say that I wanted to be involved. But then let's take it a step further. Obviously this is an event that we all would have loved to be uh, an in-person event so that everybody could come in and see the artwork for themselves, that everybody could come in and engage with us as artists and, and see this beautiful space that we're standing in today. But due to this pandemic, obviously, this is not something that we can experience. But just to think about what's taking place in this last calendar year, we're at a very pivotal moment right now as a country and as a society. And I think that as artists and arts educators, we're really at the forefront of that fight. Because when you look at society at any point in time in our history, art has always been one of our primary tools of activism. And we're living in a time right now of action. We're living in a time right now of advocacy. We're in, living in a time right now where social justice issues are finally being pushed to the forefront of society where they should have been generations ago. And when you look at the role that artists and the arts, in, uh, that artists and uh, the arts itself plays in such a fight, it's a pivotal one. Let's look, at, uh, let's look back at history. Let's take artists like Billie Holiday, who had the courage to say, you know what? Not only am I gonna record a song as controversial as Strange Fruit to bring attention to all of the black men and, and women that were being lynched all over the South and really across the country at the time, but when she saw the visceral reaction that Americans had of, of not wanting to wrestle with those hard truths, she made sure that it was in our contract for the rest of her career that she would never perform again unless she performed that song first. When you think about the courage of somebody like Anina Simone, who put her whole career on the line by having the, the, the audaciousness to believe 
that an artist's role was to reflect the times that they lived in more than anything else. You think about somebody like Langston Hughes, who taught America the language of a dream deferred for the first time. And now we fast forward to today. You see artists like a Devin Allen or a Dee Watkins from Baltimore City, who have used a camera and a book, uh, and writing books respectively, to actually tell stories from cities like Baltimore to the entire world. Art is not just our preferred language method of choice. It's the only language that allows you to supersede the barriers that divide us as a nation, to supersede the differences that separate us as, uh, as individuals, whether you be a person of color, whether you be a woman, whether you be a kid or somebody that's old. Art is something that allows you to actually wrestle with who we are, what we think, why we believe what we believe. And as long as that's the truth, as long as that's fact, we need artists to be courageous. We need artists to have the intestinal fortitude to tell their stories and control the narrative of their communities and communities like theirs. And I'm eternally grateful to places like Maryland Hall and for organizations like this around the country, because without these organizations, who's gonna advocate for the opportunities that our kids have to be creatives. And if we're no longer teaching them how to be that, how to become that, how to sustain that, then who controls the narrative of the, fut of the future? Who will talk about how we lived, what we experienced, how we coped with it, how we overcame it? If we're gonna see us move forward as a society, our artists will have to continue to be at the forefront of that fight. And Coming up next, I have the pleasure of introducing a young student that reminds me so much of all of the students that I've taught over the years. Somebody that uses art in the same way that I'm speaking about tonight. Somebody that's found therapy and self-realization through the practice of it and through organizations like this have found a home and a place where they can be seen, heard, expressed and have the opportunity to learn more. So without further ado, I would like you guys to hear the story of a young woman named Samantha and be inspired by it. I always say my best paintings are when I'm in my feelings. <laughs> when I am um, going through something or something good happens in my life, uh, I feel like I can just let myself go with the paint. And when I met Ms. Brino, uh, I just, the way that she will like manage herself the way that she would just like, you know, go about stuff and how she would teach and the way that she expressed herself. I liked that a lot. That's where the opportunity came where um, I think it was seventh grade. She was uh, starting to, she wanted to make a group, uh, which was called Jovenes Artistas. And that group was a group of 15 kids. And I, I will see them in school, but I will never talk to them, you know? But we became really good friends, even family, you know, at that time. And it was really nice because it wasn't just art. It was also talking. It was also getting to know each other. And honestly, I feel like that was a big outlet in my time period because I did, I was feeling that I was going through a lot at that time. There was a point where I was like, even became suicidal to a point. And, and it's really funny how like small things in life can build up real fast, mostly when you're that young, because you just let a whole, like, it was those feelings were what started it, but I opened a whole bunch of more doors for things to, like, you know, come in my life for it to become even worse. When I came here to the program and I started painting, my artwork, it was like an escape. Everything that I felt, I just poured it on on a canvas or on a sketchbook. I won't say that it worked all the time, but it was a working process of when I did want to self-harm myself, I would try to just grab a, like, a paint and put it on my hand and just start, you know, just expressing myself that way instead of like, you know, any other way where it's hurting myself. So I, um, I really felt it's, uh, at times it was, um, you know, an escape for me. Where do you think you might be if you hadn't found Ms. Brino and this program? 
I wouldn't be the person I am now for sure. Or who knows, you know, maybe I wouldn't be here. There was a lot of a lot of kids, right? They were all going through their stuff in their houses, you know. Like you can see them laughing, smiling at school, but you don't really know what's going inside, you know, or what's going in their homes. No matter who you are, no matter what you've been through or what you're going on, you can express yourself in arts, you know, painting, dancing, singing, anything, you know, that can make you um, just let everything out. I'm going for psychology to become a therapist because when things got really bad, uh, she helped me to speak up. And now I want to give back for everything that, you know, the world have given me and the people that God has put in my path, I want to give back the same way that they given to me. So um, the girl Samantha is a girl who wants to help people listen to them and, and just be, you know, creative in the way that I do it. If listening to that story and all the others aren't enough for you to want to participate and donate and bid on a piece of art tonight, I'm not really sure what will. Because as we realize, this art is something you can take home and have be a part of your family, your everyday life, where you look at it, you understand how much it brings to your life, the joy that you get from walking by, from listening to the music that was sung by the artist, from watching what would maybe be on your homes at work or at um, at your office or at home at all. It's special. It's more than just art. As to the artists that are creating it, it's a piece of them. And that is what they want you to take away from this. Is it offering so much more uh, than colors on a canvas? Is it is bringing joy to their lives and healing as well? So we want to thank you and thank everybody for supporting this evening. Remember to visit our online auction at until midnight tonight. We hope that you feel like we do that the arts play a critical role in the lives of our youth. Please continue to support Maryland Hall in its effort to support students in Maryland. And now, let's close the night out with Nina Freelon's anthem, One Child at a Time, found on her so-called recording. Now, Freelon took to the task of fundraising and bringing greater attention to the needs of children in education through mentoring and the arts. It's a special mission. So here now is Nina Freelon and One Child at a Time. Thank you so much, what a beautiful evening. It's the little things that we do to change this world. One child at a time, one small question answered. Just one story read, one promise kept. This is all it takes to nurture, change tomorrow, touch the future. We can turn the world around. One child, one hand held so tight, one dream lifted high up. One shoulder strong to lean upon. One person makes the difference, one heart that truly listens. We can turn the world around, one child. We can turn the world around, one child. We can turn the world around, one child. Give the 
Can turn.